This is Judith Lay saying Moromai, good morning and welcome as the churches of the island are once more at your service. Man's Radio. It's good to be with you again. Friday was our 16th day since the last case of coronavirus was recorded, which means our island has no active cases. So I think a word of thanks is due to everyone who's worked tirelessly and acted unselfishly to bring us to this stage. Right now, this year's TT should be well underway, and I know countless regular TT fans are really missing it. But there are two people who are seriously missing it, and they've never been to the island or seen anything of the races. Who they are and why they're wishing they were here is at the very heart of At Your Service today. But first, let's have some music. One of the many things that I love about doing this program is playing your hymn choices. And this morning, we've got two different people requesting two different hymns, but both are to be dedicated to the same gentleman. You might well have been taught by this person, or you might have had him refereeing your football match, or you might have played alongside him in the Salvation Army Band, because he's a teacher, a sportsman, and a fine euphonium player too. He's a native of Peel, Donald Quirk, living in retirement in Ramsey now, and it's his birthday tomorrow. And Donald, your wife Mavis has written to ask if I could possibly find a hymn that she knows means a great deal to you. The words were written by Norman MacLeod and published in the Edinburgh Christian Magazine in 1857. About 14 years later, composer Arthur S. Sullivan, of Gilbert and Sullivan fame, set the text to the tune we're going to hear now. Although Norman MacLeod wrote his text over 160 years ago, its message is just as powerful today. God will give us strength and confidence when life is challenging, if we trust in God and do the right. Donald Quirk, we celebrate the gift of your life and wish you a very happy birthday for tomorrow, as the Scottish Festival singers bring us Courage, brother, do not stumble, though the path be dark as night, there's a star to guide the humble, trust in God and do the right.
The Scottish festival singers and Courage brother Do Not Stumble, Mavis Quirk's hymn choice for her husband, Donald. Mavis and Donald, I hope you'll be listening right to the end of the programme, as there might be something else you won't want to miss. And do please keep telling me your favourite hymns. They're such an important part of At Your Service. And at the end of the programme, I'll remind you how to contact me. Now, this should have been a very special weekend for the island's Methodists. They should have been enjoying a visit from the joint leaders of the British Methodist Connection. That's the collective name for all the Methodist districts of Scotland, Wales and England, along with the Channel Islands, Shetland and, yes, the Isle of Man. Leader of the Methodist Church on the island, Reverend Richard Hall, has more. Each year at the Methodist Conference, the President, always an ordained presbyter, and Vice President, always a lay person or deacon, are elected. Despite the slightly confusing titles, the President and the Vice President are of equal standing and status and form together a joint presidency. They serve for a year and a major part of what they do during that year is to visit many of the Methodist districts across the British Isles and across the world. We usually get a visit from the President and Vice President on an annual basis. And our president this year, Barbara Lassen, and vice president, Clive Marsh, had particularly requested to be here for the middle weekend of the TT fortnight. So they should have been with us now. And by the wonders of technology, they're able to be with us this morning, even though all the recording has been done in people's own homes. And we look forward to hearing what they have to share with us. A major theme during the year for both Barbara and Clive has been the business of testimony, the business of telling our own story, because it's our own story that is perhaps the most authentic way of giving an account of the response to God's love. Thank you, Richard. Now let's hear first from the President, Reverend Dr Barbara Glasson. I'm so sorry not to be able to be with you on the Isle of Man. I've only ever seen the island from the air, but I know it's beautiful and I would love to come one day and meet you in person and hear your stories. One of the challenges of being a president is how to manage the president and vice president Facebook page. It's a bit of a minefield. The air is too busy to mention everybody and everyone, but if you mention somebody, you need to be careful who you've left out. Photos of presidents tend to be posed, so many pictures of me standing in the centre of a straight line. And you really don't want to see the pictures of the many Methodist sandwiches I've consumed. Anyway, one of the things I decided to do at the beginning of the year was to post one prayer on a Saturday night or early Sunday morning, so that people could pick it up and use it for worship or private devotion. Little did I know that we'd be locked down and that everyone would be online and the President's Prayer would reach thousands of people each week. Unfortunately, early on, one week I was away and completely forgot to post the Sunday Prayer and in order to make a virtue out of an oversight, I wrote a prayer in praise of Tuesdays. It goes like this. Tuesdays. Loving God, please bless Tuesdays. It is neither the first nor the last neither the beginning nor the end, neither the best nor the worst as a day of the week. And bless all those ordinary people who are middle-aged, middle-grade, middle-class or just fair to middling. Thank you, God, for the Tuesday people who don't give grief, who don't give earache, who don't want to make a fuss, who just get on with the job. May they know they are loved and blessed beyond words and remind me to let them know and to be thankful for Tuesdays. The Tuesday prayer turned out to be very popular, so much so that it's about to appear as a song on a CD that's about to be released in support of All We Can, the Methodist Relief and Development Agency. But that is actually another story, but watch this space. The thing is that when you're the president of a conference, people want to take you to big events, to important functions, to national gatherings, like the Service of Remembrance at Cenotaph, or to preach at Wesley's Chapel in London. But actually... The most wonderful bit of the year, for my money, is meeting people who consider themselves just ordinary. Like the woman I met on the Isles of Scilly, who sat in the graveyard day in, day out, outside the church, cleaning the headstones on the graves, and doing it so that she met bereaved families and chatted with them. Or the RAF chaplain leading prayers at the airbase. 
or the person who has sent me a postcard every month to say she's thinking of me, or the three ministers who dressed up as ugly ducklings and isolated in their romances around the country raised a thousand pounds for all we can by acting the fool. There are many good and mighty stories to be told about the Methodist Church, but mostly I'm thankful for the Tuesday people, the unsung kitchen committee, property stewards, salt of the earth kind of ordinary people who just roll up their sleeves and get on with their faith in quiet ways behind the scenes. And for ministers who in lockdown have got to grips with technology and frustrations and manage to keep in contact with the people by letter or online worship. And there are many, many people working in as care assistants or nurses or lorry drivers or mums or kids in the middle of class who are just ordinary but wonderful Tuesday people. So if you consider yourself a Tuesday person, I'd like to thank you. And I'd like to meet you one day too. For the grace no ever made. Shadowed by a weekend that's past. Thank you, Reverend Barbara Glasson, and thank you to folk musician Artie Williams, who's given us a little preview of his musical setting of Barbara's Tuesday Prayer. The CD that Barbara mentioned isn't finished yet, but Artie Williams, who's writing and performing all the music, did this recording especially for us. Thank you, Artie. And when the completed CD is ready, you can be sure we'll be featuring it in full on At Your Service. Let's hear some more now from Richard Hall. As part of our response to the COVID crisis during the time whilst churches are closed, we've been producing a lot of online resources for worship, for prayer and for meditation. And one of those sets of resources uh, is entitled My Story, a place where you can find people's stories of their own individual experience. Barbara Glasson, our president, has added her own story to that YouTube channel. You can find it on methodist.org.im. It's entitled Telling a Tale, Spinning a Yarn, and uh, it's well worth spending some time, particularly if you're thinking of how to tell your own story. I love stories, so I headed over to the Methodist Church Isle of Man YouTube channel to look at Barbara's video. It's great, and as Richard says, it's a great guide to helping people to tell their story, drawing from the greatest teller of stories, Jesus himself. Here's a little taster, and the background noise you can hear, that's Barbara working at her spinning wheel as she's talking. Let's think about that story Jesus told when he looked at the flowers and the lilies in the field, and he said... They neither sew nor spin, but surely Solomon in all his glory is not arrayed like one of these. What's going on in this story is an interesting combination of things. First of all, Jesus must have known about spinning. So I wonder, did his mum spin? Did his auntie spin? Were there people in the village that were spinning? He knew about spinning. So his experience is coming into it. But then, of course, he refers to Solomon. And Solomon is part of his tradition and also part of his scriptures. So reference to Solomon would trigger a whole load of other references in people's minds. Solomon in all his glory, he had adorned the temple with uh, jewels and fine things. People would know that reference to Solomon was about riches and finery in a way that immediately triggered another story in their minds. And then, of course, this story refers to something else again. It refers to the natural world. It refers to what Jesus can see around him. Just like the stories of Jesus, our personal stories have lots of different dimensions to them, lots of different strands. Some of them are loose ends, others are woven into the tapestry of our lives. I hope as a Christian community, we can begin to listen to each other well and begin to hear people that feel cut out and discarded and also to be able to value where God is at work, even if people are not saying that out loud, to be able to hear the work of the Spirit in people's lives. Serving alongside Barbara is Vice President Professor Clive Marsh, and he's chosen today's Bible reading, 
a few verses from chapter 21 of St. Matthew's Gospel. In this chapter, we find Jesus teaching in the temple courts. The chief priests and elders query his authority, which, understandably, sparks a discussion, during which Jesus says this to them. There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first answered the chief priests and elders. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. One of the things I've been doing a lot during my year as Vice President of the Methodist Conference, and which it would have been nice to do with Methodists on the island, had we been able to make our visit, is having lively discussions about the place of the Christian Bible in church and society. Christians of all different types and denominational backgrounds are all fully aware that the Bible is important for Christian faith, but people read it and use it in different ways. For some it's a kind of background set of texts which has helped shape the faith in which they live. For others, it's a collection of writings which they read a chunk of every day, and it supports their faith directly every day. For others, it's a text to be heard and interpreted in church and is best read by others in the context of worship. Those people in particular will be missing public worship at the moment. And then beyond the church, people have their opinions about the Bible, positive and negative. Even the celebrity atheist Richard Dawkins thinks people should learn about the Bible, even if only to be well informed to understand much of the history of English literature. But however we ourselves use the Bible, it's very often an exciting thing to do to wrestle with biblical texts in the company of others. When you don't just listen to someone expounding to you what the Bible means, but sit down alongside others, asking questions and opening up honestly about what you make of the text in front of you, when you admit to what you just don't get, and when you identify what has moved you and shaped you, and even voice what repels you in what you find in the Bible. Such conversations and group discussions can be invigorating for both faith and for life in general. I couldn't, of course, have predicted that the issue of the use of the Bible in church and society would be quite so topical. But in the week when I'm recording this message, the President of the United States, Donald Trump, has chosen to be photographed with a Bible in hand in front of the Washington church, which every US president since the early 19th century has visited. Quite what the president is up to, we must leave for another time. Personally though, in the context in which he asked for the photograph to be taken, and alongside what he's been saying in public recently, I think it was a shocking abuse of the Bible. That's not because the Bible and politics don't mix, for as Archbishop Desmond Tutu said years ago, those who say that the Bible and politics don't go together make us wonder which Bible it is they are reading. What the gesture of the President and the words of the Archbishop remind us of, though, is that the political significance of the Bible is huge and that its contents have to be used with immense care. It can be taken and twisted to serve different ends by people of very different political and ethical persuasions. Simply because something is claimed to lean on or derive from some biblical idea or other doesn't make it right. Deciding in church and society what views are worth holding and what actions are to be taken is always a massive responsibility. To be making such decisions in relation to the Bible and therefore often implying that these decisions are being made under and for God makes the process of even greater significance. It would have been nice to come and lead a session on all of this, 
but I haven't been able to. But let me leave you with just one simple exercise which you can do in your own time and you can discuss the results with others if you want. What if I were to ask you which four books of the Bible you would keep if you could only have four? In other words, instead of being given the whole Bible, as you would if you were on Desert Island Discs, and remembering that the Bible is, after all, a library of 66 books, imagine that the 66 books are in danger of being washed away from your desert island and you've only got time to rescue four. Which would they be and why? I suggest that in answering that question, it'll disclose for yourself what particular aspects of the Bible's value and use are really important to you. I want Jesus to walk with me I want Jesus to walk with me All along my pilgrim's journey I want Jesus to walk with me When I'm in trouble Walk with me When I'm in trouble Walk with me When my heart Is almost The music breaking. choice of Clive Marsh Vice President of the Methodist Conference Who enjoys looking for the spiritual In all music This is the great blues musician Eric Bibb well, in my trials, oh, walk with me. In my trials, walk with me. When my head is bowed in sorrow, you know I won't. I want Jesus I want Jesus to walk with me This week, the horrific killing of George Floyd has sparked Black Lives Matter demonstrations around the world. When I read a statement that Barbara Glasson released a few days ago, I felt it expressed the dreadful realities we must understand and pledge to change. So I invited her to read her statement for us now. This week, I released the following personal statement as president of the Methodist Conference. It is with outrage and deep sorrow that we've witnessed the recent brutal killing of George Floyd in the United States. But outrage and sorrow are not a sufficient response to racism and inequality in society. How to begin a process of change? It starts with self-examination and listening to the people whose lives are affected by discrimination and hate. This week I received these words from a Methodist living in South London. The young people whom I have worked with for over the last 15 years have felt the impact of racism in every institution they've been part of, from schools to university to workplaces. And other than local support and informal church networks, they have not found the Methodist Church as a place that speaks up for them. As your president, I start by saying I'm sorry. Sorry for being silent when we should have spoken out against the everyday injustices that affect BAME communities. I'm sorry that despite our efforts, we have not done enough for those who feel excluded, and we need to do better. We know this includes people of all ages, from the Windrush generation to the very young. I am sorry that we have not listened carefully enough and not challenged the assumptions of white privilege and bias. Repentance can lead us to change, to embody a gracious, loving spirit of inclusion and understanding. There is no excuse for racism. All people are made in God's image. We are one body in Christ Jesus. I hope we can listen more carefully to the voices of BAME members, especially young people, who face racism, discrimination and violence on a daily basis. Then our church must be brave, speak out, speak up and challenge racism wherever we find it, especially when we find it in ourselves. 
I signed the letter myself and the vice president was in full support. To find out more about how the Methodist Church is actively working to eradicate all forms of racism, visit their website at methodist.org.uk. The Methodist Church is also a member of the Joint Public Issues Team, which includes the Baptist Union of Great Britain, the Church of Scotland and the United Reformed Church, working together for peace and justice. And you can find them online too at jointpublicissues.org.uk. And so to our final hymn, and it's a second request for Donald Quirk of Ramsey. Donald, your family in the UK are so disappointed that they can't be with you for the planned birthday celebration. So your son has emailed me to ask if I could play a particular hymn to let you know they're all thinking of you and sending you much love. So that's from Jonathan and Elizabeth and all your family. And the hymn? Well, it features the combined talents of Musicale and the Regal Singers, accompanied by the Manx Youth Band. And that's all we have time for this week. My thanks to everyone who took part in today's programme and my thanks to you for continuing to choose our hymns. Do please keep letting me know your favourites. You can email me anytime on judithlay at manxradio.com and lay is spelled L-E-Y. I'd love to hear from you. So just enough time for me to say thank you for your company. I do hope you'll join me again next Sunday morning at half past nine as the churches of the island will once again be at your service. So until we meet again, this is Judith wishing you a safe, happy and peaceful week and a very good morning. The Nation Station